We're going to bring you right up to date with our breaking story this hour, that announcement that trials carried out by the US pharmaceutical giant Pfizer and the German manufacturer BioNTech suggest they have created a coronavirus vaccine which is more than 90% effective. Our health correspondent Anna Collinson joins me now. Anna, we've been hearing uh, from the CEO of Pfizer saying this is a great day for science and humanity and a significant step forward. It feels that way, is it? Yes, definitely. It de definitely feels like a huge milestone. You know, with, with these vaccines, they're one of the greatest tools that we have to get out of the lockdown restrictions that some of us are living in, the social distancing, not being able to see our loved ones. The vaccines are seen as a tool to help us get there. And this is a huge moment. So this vaccine has jointly been developed by the US drugs corporation Pfizer and the German company BioNTech. And it's the studies enrolled more than 43,000 people from across six different countries and they say the vaccine so far are, with as, as part of ongoing trials is 90% effective in preventing COVID infections and they say there's no serious safety concerns but they do have to keep collecting data. These two companies are now calling for the ability to have emergency licensing so they can get this vaccine out to the general public as quickly as possible ideally before Christmas. I mean that is the big question what needs to happen now so that it can become a available quickly? Well, while this data is extremely encouraging and this does feel like an extremely positive moment, the trials are still ongoing and what's most important with when you are thinking about a vaccine is safety. There are also lots of caveats that come with this vaccine. So, for example, it's reported the vaccine would need to be kept at minus 80 degrees. So there are issues about how you would roll this out to places, you know, we're talking about in England, NHS England are talking about preparing GPs and pharmacists to administer a vaccine. How are they going to be able to store that vaccine? Mean, at minus... there's, there's not enough cold storage available. Well, exactly, exactly. How are you going to get that out across across the globe to everywhere and have that stored appropriately? You're also bat battling attitudes. Certain people don't want to be vaccinated. They don't trust it. They don't believe in it. Um, and also, uh, it's also important to point out that this vaccine probably, almost certainly, won't work for everyone. Multiple different types of vaccines will be needed, like what we see with uh, the seasonal flu, for example. And also, it just won't work for some people. So other measures will still be needed. So when they say it's 90% effective, have they broken that down? Does that mean across every age group? Because obviously there's more concern mm. for the elderly and the vulnerable. So what we have at the moment, and as you know, this story is only broken in the last hour or so, is they are saying 90% across the board. But they have covered a wide range of groups of people, uh, people as young as 16, uh, people with HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, so, And they've covered people from across six different countries. So they do have a real uh, overview of what's going on. But Another question that often springs up when we're talking about vaccine, how long would it be effective for? Do we know that? Well, again, this is this is it. You know, they're trialling a, a vaccine that up until now, it's, it's however old, you know, it, it could be working up to this point, but we don't know. So it's all about trying to um, get as much data as possible and uh, being as hopeful as possible, getting it out as quickly as possible and testing and making it sure it's as safe as possible. But yeah, the hope is that it would uh, deal with the symptoms. The concern is it may not completely tackle the infection. OK, Anna, stay with us. We're going to bring in uh, Dr Sophie Harmon, who is global health expert and professor of international politics at Queen Mary University, London. Sophie, your reaction to this news from Pfizer? Well, of course, it's very exciting. I think, you know, the world has been waiting for this vaccine. So I think it's a testament to how pharmaceutical companies, scientists, governments have been working together. However, let's not get carried away. As your correspondent was just saying, there is an issue of safety, scale. We still don't know a lot about it, but there is a pause for thought. This does come with some cautions, though. This shouldn't be a reason for us to take, you know, the foot off the pedal with, in terms of getting the basics right around tracking the virus, test and trace and things like that. We still need those. Vaccines are not a silver bullet. And again, we have this wider question of trust and access. And I think these are the two issues that are going to really come into play. Globally, what needs to be done about that issue, Sophie? Because actually in the past 10 minutes, we've heard from the German health minister as well. And he has said we're really going to need a high level of acceptance of a vaccine like this for it to be effective. What can the health professionals, governments do to you know, ensure that that exists amongst the public? Well, this is a huge 
challenge. And I think the one thing is there is goodwill towards science and public health. So trying to increase transparency around the trials. I think having a lot of volunteers participate also helps so people can understand that this isn't science happening somewhere in a laboratory. It involves us as citizens as well. But of course, it's about countering these false narratives around concerns around vaccines. It's about not necessarily dismissing people, but meeting where they're kind of unease is and trying to explain it. It's also about community mobilizing. So we know that in previous anti-vaccination issues, actually having building trust within community among community leaders is huge. So it's not just about world leaders or public health officials, you know, making announcements around the safety of vaccines. It's about looking at community healthcare workers and community politicians really driving home that message of trust. You mentioned world leaders. They do have a very big role to play, though. And the news today that Joe Biden is setting up a task force straight away, that is his main priority as he is president-elect now of the US. What do you make of that, Sophie, and the importance of that moment of saying, I'm making up a task force, it's going to have scientists, experts, Republicans, Democrats, but you know, we're going to tackle this and science is going to be you know, the main argument that we use now. Yeah, absolutely. So Joe Biden was consistent on the campaign trail that he was going to follow the science. And, you know, day one as president elect or working day one, he's come out with this task force. Now, remember, there were scientists and public health officials on Trump's task force for COVID-19, but it was led by Vice President Mike Pence. Not the case with Biden. He's got three scientific scientists and public health officials leading this. And not only that, he's saying, right, you tell me what to do, I'm going to follow you. Now, that's not the whole case, because of course, Biden is going to have to do some really sophisticated political um, bipartisan support to back his plan. We know that the US is divided. We saw that with the election results. And if he's going to get his strategy to have Americans wear masks as a mandatory intervention, he is going to need to get the Republicans on side. Well, it also just helped though, Sophie, in terms of global cooperation around tackling mm. the pandemic, if we have Joe Biden in charge in the White House. His attitude, for instance, towards the WHO and, and other organisations just may change the whole tone of discussion. Oh, yes, very much so. So I think on Saturday, you could probably hear the sigh of relief coming from Geneva, from the World Health Organisation, that Biden was going to become president-elect. He has been very explicit in saying that he will recommit the US to the World Health Organization, but he has also noted that the WHO is, you know, it's not without its flaws. So he's going to be a supporter of it, but this doesn't mean that he's not going to be a critical supporter of the WHO. But really, when it comes to global health security, we're seeing a reset to 2016. We're seeing Global Health Security Directorate reset up in the White House, more money towards the Centers for Disease Control, and as you say, a commitment to multilateral institutions like the WHO. What's going to be important is to see what Biden does around COVAX. Now, COVAX is the organization around vaccines and ensuring equitable access to vaccines in lower middle income countries. Trump has shown very little interest in that. So let's see what Biden says. Dr. Sophie Harmon, great to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us. Sophie, they're talking about COVAX. I wanted to ask you well, as well, Anna, about availability and distribution mm. of the Pfizer vaccine. It's not the only one in development. There are other vaccines. Bring us up to date in terms of where they are at, mm. and then what happens? Which countries get which vaccine? Mm. How does that whole process work? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's hundreds of vaccines sort of in the pipeline, and around 12 that are at this stage. And Pfizer's the one that sort of beat those other to the post with this big announcement today. Uh, another vaccine that has been in the running, particularly the UK's had their eye on, is a vaccine from the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca. Now, they are all in a similar state stage to uh, Pfizer. And as I say, as the, the, the data from Pfizer is looking particularly encouraging, we still have to wait to the end of this trial to see how that turns out. And it's the same with the other vaccines that are also in the pipeline. Uh, so yeah, so as I say, this, this uh, vaccine has sort of taken the lead uh, at this point, uh, but it could be that as time goes on, other ones overtake, that certain vaccines have um, are more useful for treating a certain type of people, a certain group of people. Um, so it's really uh, still so much to play for, but a huge moment. 
Thank you so much for being with us, Anna, and uh, we'll let you get back to looking into what's happening with this Pfizer vaccine. We'll bring you more as soon as we get it, but certainly a very big moment in terms of tackling the pandemic.